today is July 21st. We'll be studying today Matthew 28 or Matthew 18, uh, the unforgiving servant. And if you haven't already, please open your Bibles. Turn with me to so go back to what Amy just read for us in the Bible reading. I'll comment on a few things, and then I'm going to dive into the passage at the end. There's a parable that's here. So uh, the passage starts out. Uh, Jesus can you teach? And so at that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, "Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven?" So they're squabbling amongst themselves. They sort of understand that there's some sort of hierarchy here going on. And, uh, you know, you look at the other uh, Gospels reading this text, um, you know, they're squabbling amongst the brothers. Um, one of them actually has one of the mothers of, of two of the, uh, the brothers of the disciples. And, and she's really kind of concerned about their position in the overall hierarchy here. How is it? Who's going to be first? How is this going to work? It's kind of funny at this point that they're starting to squabble over, over you know, sort of who's going to be in, in charge here and, and how exactly this is going to be. In fact, she actually asked them in that version, you know, we, we promised me, Jesus, that my sons will sit at your left side and your right side in heaven. And he's like, you don't know what you're asking. You really, you really don't understand what you're asking. Well, anyway, so the point of this is that Jesus' response to these various versions is that you're asking the wrong question. Um, and so he goes and grabs a child and, and said, you know, calling them a child, they, they put him in the midst of them and said, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, I don't know if that's for about being having a childlike faith. I think probably part of it is, um, you know, we, we do everything we can here at Stepping Stones to understand. We do what we can to understand the word of God. We do what we can to understand our Lord. But at the end of the day, we're not going to get it all, and in that sense, it is very nice to envy the children in their childlike faith, and that's being that it's relatively simplistic. Um, we, we have to fall back to that. Yes, we do our best to understand the mysteries of the faith, but at the end of the day, we must appreciate the fact we're not going to get it all. And anybody who tells you they've got it all figured out, I think you should probably be afraid of, and I certainly am not the person there. So, um, verse 4, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. The Bible tells us that the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. And so it's by humbling ourselves that we are then allow God to raise us up as he sees fit, and his timing is perfect. Well, he goes on to talk about the kids a little bit. Verse 5, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of his little ones to believe in me to sin, be a greater, better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and drowned in the depth of the sea. He's saying that <clears throat> to go ahead and lead children astray, or anyone, any young in the Christ astray, of course, is a horrible thing. And he goes on to say, woe to the world for temptations to sin. And these the words that he describes here, saying, well, it's necessary for temptations to come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. He's saying that, that it, it's bad that we are tempted, but it's bad, even worse, to be a tempter or a temptress to be the person who brings temptation to someone else's door and perhaps causes them to stumble is larger than the sin that they themselves create. And so I, I think you need to keep that in mind. I think I need to keep it in mind. We all do. In relation to things that are there, we, 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 we discussed over in the, in the, with the Apostle Paul, um, is it okay to do certain things? He uses the example of eating meat offered to idols. Is it okay to do these things? And Paul's answer is twofold. One is, Sure, it's fine in your freedom in Christ, unless in using your freedom in Christ you cause your brother to stumble, and then it becomes sin. And I think you all can appreciate that, um, that it's simply a matter of, 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 you know, that if your freedom, you're being so free that you're allowing those around you to, to, uh, to see temptation, well, that's not good, and that's simply something that, that's going to, uh, to cause dissension and cause problems there. Uh, now, he goes in, Jesus does this occasionally, but he uses what's called hyperbole, giving an extreme example. Um, no, no point in the Bible is he asking you to mutilate yourself. Please don't misunderstand that. Um, and if your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. But if you enter life crippled or lame, then with two hands or two feet, to be thrown into eternal fire. It says the same thing about your eye. If your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It's better if you enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. So I've said this before, but it bears repeating here. What's an example of that? Well, those of you that um, have seen the movie Fireproof, the, the main uh, actor has a, a significant problem with online pornography. And so he does what he can to try and, 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 and get away from it. And finally, there's a point where he grabs his computer, rips it out into the yard, takes a baseball bat to it, smashes the screen. 
Well, that would be the equivalent of him cutting off, you know, obviously his, uh, his, you know, cutting out his hand or cutting off his eye or, you know, whatever the case would be um, in that regard. It is taking the step of apparently that there's no way he's going to be able to successfully uh, be able to, to, to be around the Internet, at least not during that part of his life, um, without, you know, being, surfing pornography. So he takes the spot where he did have his computer, where he spent hours and hours, and he replaces it with a, with a vase of roses for his wife, who's, by the way, trying to divorce him at the time. Um, but he's, you know what I'm saying, going through this effort to try and, uh, and, and, and make a statement, which he does make a statement, that this is something that he's willing to, to rip out of his life and to try and make a difference. That, I think, is a valid interpretation here. We, there are times when we simply have to say, you know, I mean, if, if you were an alcoholic, and if you said to me, gosh, every time I go to the bar, I have a slip, I would say, don't go to the bar. But that means I can't hang around my friends. As a Christian, shouldn't I listen to witness to them? Well, yeah, you should. But to be honest, you're not doing a great job if every time you end up on the floor crawling home. Okay. You know, so you know, it's the old joke, doctor, doctor, when I raise my hand, arm, it hurts. The doctor says, don't do that. Same deal here. If there's an area that you know, if you do X, you're going to sin, right, then don't do X. Or at least avoid it with prudence and go through and, and make sure that you're aware of it. And that is the essence, I think, of what Jesus is trying to teach us is here. Verse 10, see that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you, this is just an interesting verse. For I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Now, if you're looking for a verse to, to, to get guardian angels for, for little people, I, th this might be one of your few verses you can lift up. We, we don't get many glimpses into the whole workings of angels in heaven and this and that, but this is one that gives a little bit of an interesting statement. There are verses over in Revelation that talks about specific angels dedicated to each church, say to the church of Ephesus, following, say to the church, you know, this. And so there's an implication that each church, I believe it's literal, um, has an angel. And then there's a statement here, the possessive, their angels. So I tell you, they are the little children. Their angels always see the face of my father. Um, the implication here is that there is an angel. I guess, sort of attached to them, and somewhat uh, there, whether that's a guardian angel. We don't have that exact phrase anywhere inside of, uh, of the Bible, but, but this is certainly the closest that we get that I'm aware of. And I find it very interesting that, that Jesus would sort of just let this one, sorry, slip, as it were, just sort of mentioned it in passing, and I'm, I'd be going, wait, can we back up to the whole angel part again? <laughs> Jesus, can we rewind, please? Uh, very interesting. All right. And he goes on to say, what do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountain and go in search of the one that's gone astray? And if he finds it truly, I say to you, he rejoices over it more. How much? More. He rejoices over the one that was lost and found more than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. Isn't that interesting? And there are some of us that try to walk a, a walk that... Uh, almost feel like, well, what about us? We, were, we didn't go astray, maybe, or maybe we were the ones. Well, we all went astray at some point in our life, I think, is the point here, and uh, we've all been found. So it is not the will of my Father who is heaven that one of these little ones should perish. That is not his will. It's not his desire, and uh, we are to be part of that plan. Well, it's then talking about forgiveness now as we move to the second part of the chapter, but I wanted to cover some of those interesting points first before I jumped into here. Uh, so, uh, verse 15, if your brother sins against you, so your brother, your sister, the word brother here, implication, is probably one that is in the church, and you know, that's backed up by further statements that are coming here. So your brother or sister, this is, this is your Christian brother or sister, one who is in Christ, in the church with you, either the church, uh, you know, in the local New Testament church sense, like Stepping Stones, or at least in the broader church sense that they're in the, the you know, church uh, overall, um, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. So this happens at times where we have an injury, and the question is, what do I do about it? And if you're like me, you're more inclined to tell 15 other people than you are the one person who actually you feel hurt you. Can I get an amen on that? Is that, is that the way we are? And we, we do it in the context, perhaps, of counseling. Well, I just want to get some good counsel from somebody else. True. And maybe you do. And maybe you do get good counsel and so forth. But it's really easy to certainly go through and have many, 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 many discussions. I mean, how much counsel are you looking for here? But uh, to go through and have many, many, many discussions about the one who hurt you 
rather than ever go to the person who you feel hurt you. Sometimes that hurt is intentional. Sometimes the person meant to hurt you. Sometimes it's, it's certainly callous. Sometimes it's a misunderstanding. Sometimes it is not there. And in the case of someone who's in the church, particularly with Christians, we are called to think the best of Christians. We are called to give them the benefit of the doubt. And so if we think the person said, or we heard them say these words, and we think what they meant was this, and we're horrified and angry and upset and whatever, you owe it to the person. I'll say that again. You owe it to the person the benefit of the doubt to bring it up to them so that they can say, oh, yes, I said those words, but that's not at all what I meant. This has happened to me a few times, by the way, where I've made comments at work, and they are taken completely out of context, and it's not at all what I meant, and I've been given well, the times I know about, I've been given the benefit of the doubt by the person, and I'm so grateful they've allowed me to explain that is completely not what I was talking about. I didn't mean that at all. I was talking about this other situation, and the person's like, oh, well, then I agree with you then. Okay, thank you. Why'd you bring, I'm so glad you brought this to me. I'm so glad you honored me that you, you brought this to me and were able to talk this through. And then sometimes I said, well, I did say that. I, maybe, I, maybe I shouldn't have said that, or maybe I didn't uh, think that through. And if so, I, I, I certainly apologize for that. And so it's important that you, you both, if you're on the receiving end or the giving end of this one, you take some time, and if you realize you're in one of those situations, I try to take a clue from Nehemiah and shoot a quick arrow to heaven, a really fast prayer. Oh, God, watch my tongue, and, and please let me have the word, right words to say. Let me listen before I speak, and then let me speak with your, your wisdom and your patience and very carefully choose my words during those moments as the situation is developing. Because it could really make or break a friendship here. Okay? Um, so if you uh, do that, you've gained your brother, verse 16. But if he does not listen, take one or two others, still trying to keep it private, still trying to keep a small group along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. So, okay, you went to them in private first, and that didn't work. Then you go back and bring one or two other people, not, not a huge crowd, so that everything can be established by two or three witnesses. And if he refuses to listen to that, then you take it to the next level. You take it to the entire church. And then if the church responds and he refuses to even listen to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile or a tax collector, which means that you basically excommunicate him. If the person, by excommunicate, you mean put out of the church. If the person has an injury with somebody else and they absolutely will not make any attempt at reconciliation and it's being divisive to the body, then there's reason to say, look, you, you can't hang out here and sit there and wound other people and then not be willing to come back and talk to, and, and, you know, in the spirit of Christ and be able to try and make amends. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. I don't totally know what that means. I know that it means the power of prayer is substantial, and I know that it means that we are given great power as followers of Christ. But I can't tell you exactly what it means in terms of how it works out. Verse 19, again I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. So this is where we often get multiples of us praying together about a various topic um, so that we have two or more, of course, praying together to have his, our voices then raised in unison. Now, very often, we talked about prayer before, um, if something tragic happens and someone's in a hospital, our knee-jerk, our human reaction is to say, heal their body, heal their body. That's clearly what the right answer is here, God. That's clearly what we all want. But it may not be what, in fact, the, the outcome of this is supposed to be. And, and it's hard to express that, but I think it's important that you understand that the plan may very well be that by them go ahead and passing on, greater good can come from that. And it's very difficult for me to explain that. And I apologize if, that's, if I hurt anyone by saying that. But you need to understand these are deeply complex issues. There's a lot going on on these. And to simply make it as simple as it's all about that person being healed physically there's a much bigger picture going on than just that one person and their particular body. So, where two of you agree on earth, anything will be done for them by my Father in heaven, but bear in mind, of course, um, our Holy Spirit inside of us does translate into what we really should be asking for, and our prayers go up one way, but God hears them as they should be. That's perfect prayers. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Verse 21 and Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? 
of course, the standard was in the, 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 for the Pharisees was, of course, three times. Uh, three times, three strikes and you're out. And so Peter's trying to be very, uh, trying to be a big man here and saying seven, seven times, more than twice as much. And Jesus says to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. And some manuscripts say 70 times seven. Either way, whether it's 77 or 490, Jesus is saying, you don't count. You don't sit there and try and count the number of times. God doesn't keep score with you. You don't keep score as well. And, you know, Jesus kind of shakes, I'm sorry, Peter probably shakes his head a bit at this and kind of going, that's crazy. And so Matthew, Matthew yeah, the story of Matthew, Matthew continues to write then in verse 23, what Jesus explains. Well, like, Jesus says, look, it's like this. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Anybody know how much money that is? 10,000 talents? I'll mention it in the notes in a minute. But let's just say it's a whole heck of a lot of money. And I'll give you the math in just a minute so you can see it. And since he could not pay, the master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. Now, the interesting part about this is that the debt is so high, it is so incredibly astronomical, there's no way, I mean, there's no, 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 no way ever, ever, ever the guy could ever pay off the debt. So if he had said, for example, well, you can wait in prison until you can pay it off, it would be a lifetime sentence. If he had put, you know, he'd sold them all into slavery until it was paid off, it would be slavery for a lifetime. There's no way he can ever get enough money back to pay this. And so the king, out of his, out of his grace, out of his ability to forgive, which is greater than the ability of the person to create the debt against him. I'll say that again. The king can forgive more than the man can pay back. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave the debt. Don't worry about it. You don't owe me that pile of cash. Verse 28, but when the same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. Now, a denarii is the coin you would have represented for a day's worth of wages. So this is the amount of money you'd earn in a hundred days. Still a lot of money, but could it be paid off? Could be. Pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused and went and put into prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. So he had said, Okay, I'll set all of this debt aside. And yet, of course, the same person who had been forgiven so much was unable to then forgive so much less. So you don't have mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to you, to every one of you, if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. It's a hard reading. It's a hard piece. So grab your notebooks if you would. Let's talk about, so what about forgiveness? I've got three points I want you to jot down. Let's start with number one. First, and I believe me, this is really, really, really tough on this first point. You have to get over yourself. You have to get over yourself. And by that I mean you are not the injured party. God is. Now everybody here listening to my voice today has been injured. Everybody's been hurt by somebody else. Every single one of us has been hurt. And I know that when someone really hurts you deeply, your immediate reaction is to say, oh, that didn't really hurt me. That hurt God. Right? Isn't that what we do? Um, no. <laughs> but think about that one for a minute. That in fact, God is the real injured party. We never think that. We never, ever, 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 ever think, well, I mean, rarely. We rarely think that. I'll say never. We rarely think that. 
all of your hurt, all of the times people lashed out at you, God was the one who ultimately took the real offense. Now you may ask, how do I know this? Well, it's really simple. I know this to be true because if that person, that's a big if, but if that person asks forgiveness of God, God will grant forgiveness of the wrong done to him. And he does not stop to ask you permission. God does not go, excuse me, would it be okay with you if I forgave the person for that particular wrong? <laughs> Do you understand the implications here? God, and this is, the, this is the interesting part about Jesus forgiving sins, is that when he's walking around on earth and he's the one forgiving sins, it's like the craziest thing in the world for him to do, unless he's God. You understand? I mean, that's the only way this thing makes sense. Paul says our, real, our home in nature is tough to overcome, really tough, I would agree. But God doesn't ask your permission to forgive the sins that are done against him. We probably don't like that. Well, doggone it, God, I, they, they did this to me, and it really hurt. And they don't, God doesn't ask you your permission to forgive, guys. He doesn't ask me either. He's the real injured party. Yes, we experience pain. I'm not suggesting your pain is not real. It is. But the real pain, the real hurt, and the real offense is actually God's. Because he's the one that writes the standards of what are right and wrong, and that's what's violated. So all of those things that you thought you had control of the forgiveness of, you know, the ones that you, you still got stored in your wallet, the ones you're like, oh, I'm going to get to this at some point and forgive this, but not today. The ones you got stacked up there, I mean, you probably have those, right? I mean, I do. I, I, I assume you're like me. All those things you thought you had control of the forgiveness of, all of those things you were trying to become big enough to forgive, I'm going to get there at some point. I'm going to get there at some point. I'll be big enough. I'm praying my way through it. I'm not there yet. You think you're in control of those. Guess what? For all you know, they already asked forgiveness of God. Now, you might say, oh, this person wouldn't. He would never do that. You don't know. But if they already asked forgiveness of God, it means God's already wiped it clean, and God's way of forgiving is better than our way of forgiving. He buries it in the sea of forgetfulness. God's already forgotten about it. That was an interesting statement, right? And for all we know, that person may be at peace. So there's three parties here. The other person, there's you, and there's God. So if two out of the three, God and the other person, are already got it taken care of, hmm, let's see, God's done with it. And perhaps if the other person may be done with it, who does that leave holding all the broken pieces? Who exactly is the one here carrying the weight of the situation? Who's the one who thinks they're in control and waiting until they're big enough to forgive? And the answer is you and me. Trying to get permission from you to let go of what you only have. I find the situation ironic. And some of you probably aren't real happy with me at the moment. But this is the way this stuff works. Is that we... It becomes, when we become what we perceive to be the injured party, it becomes a control issue. That we're now in control of deciding when we will or won't let go of that particular item or forgive that person. It becomes a control point. And I think you need to understand, you're not as much control as you think you are, and I'm not either. So again, step one, it's not about you. Forgive quickly and move on. It's not about you. Forgive quickly and move on. Step two. Recognize that you were forgiven first. Step two. Recognize that you were forgiven first. In the parable, you are not God, the king. I'm, I'm not either. You're not. I mean, I kind of like to be that, right? And they're like, I'm, I'm the king, and I've been wronged with this big piece, and I get to forgive. I would like to see myself in that capacity. You're not God. I'm not God. That's not our role in the parable. Our role in the parable, unfortunately, is the middle layer. 
you and I, you are the one who cheated God and was forgiven a huge debt. How much? Well, in case you're curious, 10,000 talents works out to approximately 150,000 years worth of wages with an $8 minimum wage, which isn't quite, but assuming an $8 minimum wage is $2,250,000,000. I, I mentioned earlier, there ain't no way he's ever going to pay it back. Do you get my deal? I mean, and people listening to Jesus' story was like, that's like, I mean, that, I mean, they're trying to understand, that's like all the wealth of Israel. That's like, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> humans don't owe that much money, Jesus. I mean, you understand? That? You, you, you don't, nobody could rack up a bill that high. That's just like silly. I mean, nobody could ever pay that much. And he's like, yes, that is exactly my point. You can never, ever, ever pay your spiritual debt. There is no way. There's no, no way you could ever pay your spiritual debt to God for all the things you've done wrong. It costs too much. One tiny sin is too expensive, and we have a whole lifetime worth. So he's looking at you and saying, do you understand that this is what you've been forgiven of? And, and unfortunately, this example, the, it gets, we say, lost in translation. Well, this is a good example. 10,000 talents. Okay. But if I say $2 billion, you go, oh, all right. I understand. So... <laughs> I could never pay a bill that much. Yeah, right, exactly. All right, so in the parable, you're not God, the king. You were the one who cheated God and was forgiven a huge debt. So you've been forgiven the $2 billion. Because you were forgiven much, you should be able to forgive little. How little? 100 denarii, that's approximately $6,400. Okay, now is it going to hurt, so to speak, to forgive $6,000, you're looking at going, I could really use $6,400 right now. I could really, really use $6,000. But in fact, would it destroy you financially to forgive $6,000? Would it ruin your entire life? Believe it or not, guys, if you're here listening to me and my voice on the computer and you can afford an internet connection, during your lifetime, you probably could take that hit. Do you understand? I mean, you... you, you you, you, maybe you think you couldn't, but believe it or not, you probably could. You could actually survive that as a lifetime loss, and you could go through and absorb that. You could not pay $2 billion, but you could absorb the 6000 And this is the point. You have been forgiven much. I have been forgiven much, much, much. And so, therefore, I could at least forgive a little. Your perceived slights your peace is against you, the difficulties you feel, these are but light and temporary pains, guys. They're just a little bit. I remember a story that uh, I, I told part of before, but I, I think I'll repeat it here anyway, and that was the that uh, this one, one one young musician was, was talking to us. That we were in, in a church in Kentucky, and he was telling a story that he had a, a vision of, of seeing uh, you know, some of the, the various apostles and so forth with t-shirts on. They were up in heaven. And, you know, Peter was there. I was crucified upside down for my Lord. Jesus has a t-shirt that said, I was, you know, I was crucified for the sins of the world. Paul had a t-shirt that said, I was beheaded for, you know, for my belief in Christ. And uh, he was, was there. And his difficulty was that he, because of work he'd been doing for Christ, he had to eat, eat cold french fries because his fries were cold that night because he didn't get a chance to take care of something. And his T-shirt said, I ate cold french fries for Christ. Think about that in terms of what exactly it is that happened to you. Maybe it's a lot more than cold french fries. Maybe somebody really hurt you physically. Maybe they hurt you financially. Maybe they keep trying to do so. Maybe they really, really are lashing out at you because they feel, for whatever reason, that it's going to make them feel better if they hurt you. That happens a lot in our world. A person thinks that, that you're the cause of their issue. Maybe you were at some point. But because of that, they feel that they will feel better if they can cause you some pain, get some money out of you, get you to say something, do some sort of whatever. And that's the way they're wired up right now. It's hard. It's really hard when somebody out there is trying to cause you pain. And yet, what is that pain compared to what we are called to be able to look at what Christ has done? And what is that in relation to what exactly it is that we ourselves have been forgiven of? Now, I heard this, I've said it before, 
I'm going to say it again. I'm not asking you to be a doormat. I'm not asking you for the person to put yourself in a situation. If you're, if you're a wife today and you've been abused, I'm not saying you need to put yourself back in the abusive situation. Forgiving doesn't mean letting yourself be used as a doormat or a punching bag. It does mean that you can then change the relationship so you don't extend the same trust to that person in the same way. You may very well say, I forgive you, but I'm not going to put back the situation so you get to hit me again. Okay? But you do forgive what's there. And we forgive because of what was given to us. In fact, that gets us to the idea that if you have this part that, well, man, that's going to really cost me, maybe you just need to charge that to God's account. Maybe you just put it on God's tab. Because you know what? He's already put $2 billion on for you. You could just say, well, I'll just charge the 6000 to him. Okay? You just go ahead. He's already covered your tab. Which kind of brings us to step three. Step three, I'd like you to remind you, I'd like for you to remember that Jesus paid it all. It's a great song. We're going to close that song in a minute, or at least a version of it. Jesus paid it all. I think it's very important to understand that we are very quick to claim this fact about our own sins. Hallelujah. Praise God. Jesus paid it all. He paid all of my sins. No? No, Jesus paid all of all the sins, including the ones that you see are against you. Jesus paid it all, every single one of them. So even when somebody injures you tomorrow, Jesus has already paid for that one too. We are quick to claim this in relation to our own forgiveness and our own sins. But Jesus has already paid for all the sins of the world all the way around. You don't need to go the other person for healing. You don't need to get it from them. You need to get healing when you forgive them and allow Jesus to heal your wounds with his precious blood. That's the stuff that really heals. And it's the stuff that fills in the gaps and lets you know it's going to be okay. So with that, I get to my question of the week, which quite obviously is, what do I, or who do I, need to forgive today? What do I need to forgive today? Is there something you've been carrying around, trying to wait till you're big enough to be able to forgive it? Just go ahead and give it up, guys. Jesus paid it all. It's already taken care of. It's possible you're the only one carrying it around. Is there something that is just really, really, really got you? that you just really want that person to come to a point and do certain things before you're going to let it go, you're the one who's tied up in this. Forgive them, and by forgiving them, release yourself so you can move on and you can go to where God wants you to be. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord God, forgiveness is not easy. God, we are amazed at what you forgave us for. Teach us today to let go. Let us know that you are the one in control, and you are the one who truly, truly forgives. Help us to let you be in control, and let your grace wash over us this and every day. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen.